What's cracking guys? With this video, I'm kicking off a series of uh, video tutorials about JAX. So what is JAX exactly? Let's see the official docs here. Uh, basically, JAX is an Autograd and XLA, which stands for Accelerated Linear Algebra uh, Compiler, which is basically a compiler developed by Google that co-evolved with the uh, development of TPU units. Uh, we're going to see uh, a lot of XLA later, so I thought just kind of explaining the ter terminology. So they are basically brought together for high-performance numerical computing and machine learning research. So in a nutshell, we can treat uh, JAX as a, like a machine learning language library and uh, you need to be cautious not to compare JAX directly to PyTorch or to TensorFlow because uh, JAX is kind of like a mid-level uh, like library and people have been building on top of it. So we have, uh, as for the high-level deep learning libraries, we have the two most popular ones are Haiku coming from, from DeepMind and we have uh, Flex coming from the Google research team. So basically, aside from that, DeepMind team has been developing uh, for every single uh, like domain, particular domain, such as GraphML or RL, they've been developing uh, like a purposeful, um, a dedicated library built on top of JAX. So for example, for GraphML, they've built up a thing called uh, GRAPH or JAX for graphs. That would be like a acronym pretty much. Uh, having mentioned Flex, I think it's worth noting that uh, on Hugging Face Hub, you have uh, more than 5,000 models at the at the time of the, this recording uh, that you can use, download and play with them. And I think most of them were written in Flex. And that's the reason why I'll be covering both Haiku and Flex in some of the future videos. Uh, that out of the way, uh, let me tell you what I'm going to cover in this uh, series of videos. So in the first two videos, I'm going to explain the nitty gritty details of JAX. And then uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to code uh, neural networks from scratch in both pure JAX as well as Flex, as well as Haiku. Uh, also, those of you who know me, you know that I'm a big fan of a top-down approach when teaching. And basically here, I'm going to go a bit differently because the, the topic is kind of complex. And the first two videos are going to go, so the first one is going to go from mid-level of abstraction uh, down to lower, lower levels of abstraction. Uh, and we're going to understand the nitty gritty details of JAX in this video. Uh, the second one will be mid-level to higher levels of abstraction. And as I said, the last three videos uh, there will be hands-on, and those are going to be on a high level of abstraction. We won't be uh, digging deeper into the primitives. We're just going to build uh, from the components we learned in the first two videos. We're going to build neural networks from, from scratch. So um, aside from that, as you can see here, I have a code skeleton already uh, here, and uh, the, there is a reason behind that. First, uh, if I was writing, if, if I was coding everything from scratch, uh, that would take a, this video would be two hours long. Uh, secondly, this is way more natural because you usually never ever build uh, build stuff from your head from scratch. You take you either take some snippets from the documentation, from Stack Overflow, or from some somebody else's repo. So it's very I want to stress the understanding here. It's important that we understand the code so that we can modify it. And I think it's less important for you to understand how to code this up from your head because nobody does that. I mean, sometimes I even like forget how to write down if name equals main in the main uh, like file of a Python program. So you just search for stuff if you don't understand how to write something down. Okay, let's dig down into the code. Um, first off, I I'm in Google Colab here. Um, I enable the GPU accelerator in the background and the, 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 this Jupyter file, which I'm gonna share with you uh, after this video, I'm gonna open source it on my GitHub, uh, is structured into two uh, like sections. The first one is warming up with JAX. Basically, we're on the mid-level of abstraction uh, pyramid, let's call it that way. And then we're going deeper, uh, understanding the nitty gritty details behind many uh, of Jack, JAX primitive uh, transform functions, such as JIT, GRAD, etc. We're gonna see those in a second. Okay, let's, let's, let's start. So first things first, um, I want you to understand that uh, JAX uh, is, uh, JAX's API is very similar to NumPy's. And second thing I want you to take off from this section is that JAX code is accelerator agnostic. And we're going to see what that means exactly. Okay, let's let's dig into the actual code. So as I said, uh, for the most part, uh, the syntax is the same as NumPy's. And you can see here, we are importing from JAX. There is this module called NumPy, and the convention is just to import it as JNP. Uh, they also have a SciPy API, uh, so JAX SciPy, but we're not going to use that one in this video. Uh, so these functions that are called transform functions are a vital component of JAX. So those are GRAD, JIT, VMAP, and PMAP. 
and you'll be seeing these a lot uh, throughout this this notebook and in general using Jax. So um, Aside from that, uh, Jax is structured, so the API is structured like an onion, uh, as usually software uh, like uh, libraries are. So we have the, the high level API, which is the NumPy. Then we have this thing called, called Lex. And finally, we have, I guess, XLA, uh, which is, I think, in C++, right? Okay, so uh, because I'm a, I'm a etymology nerd, uh, I just thought writing this down. Uh, basically, Lex is just an anagram for XLA, which is a compiler. And I'm not completely sure how people came up with the name Jax. So if anybody knows, uh, feel free to type it down in the comment section. Let's see a couple of facts about Jax. So the first thing I already mentioned, the syntax is remarkably similar to NumPy's. If I run this, we can see we have uh, we have defined 1,000 points on the x-axis equally spaced from 0 to 10. And I just uh, plot the function 2 sine cosine. And we just plot it. We, we get the chart here. Uh, you can see that Jax syntax is completely similar. Like it's, it's actually same. If you just uh, switch MP for JMP, you get lin space, sine, cosine, plot. Uh, you can, like as you can see here, the arrays can be directly uh, inserted into the matplotlib uh, plot function. So if I run this one, we get the same results. Okay, so that's it. So that's the first fact. Second fact. Um, so that's something you you need to get comfortable with, and that's the functional programming uh, paradigm. Especially if you're only familiar with the object-oriented programming paradigm, this is going to be a bit rough. But like I I, I promise you, there are some awesome benefits that uh, functional programming brings with it. So um, Jax arrays are immutable. So that's uh, one of the three like that's one of the common properties you see in functional uh, programming uh, in, in functional programs. So um, what that means is the following. Um, if we take a, like a NumPy array here, so numbers from 0 to 9, uh, we print them out and I then modify the, 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 the array at index 0 and I add some random number like 23. And if I run this, everything is fine. We have the original array and we have the modified array. And as you can see, x is modified in place, which means uh, the array is by definition mutable. On the other hand, if we take this uh, the same program and run it here, so I create this time Jax array instead of NumPy array, and I try to modify the uh, array in place, this is what's going to happen. So we are going to get an exception here, as you can see. Uh, basically, uh, Jax is complaining that we, uh, it says here, object does not support item assignment. So you cannot uh, basic, basically modify the array in place. So this is the solution. It's kind of rough, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, you have to do this add syntax with index and then set the value and this is going to work. Finally, you can see that we are not like modifying x in place. We basically allocate additional object in the memory uh, called y and now we have both the original array as well as the uh, novel array. So you may think here, uh, well, this is kind of suboptimal, right? Well, the, the trick is, and we're going to see that a bit later, uh, like Jax uses something called JIT, which uses something called XLA, which basically takes care of this stuff behind the curtains. So you don't have to worry about this. So if it notices that you're not using the original array, it's going to just do this in place and avoid allocating another memory object. So yeah, that's taken care of. Um, so that's the, the, the second thing I wanted to, to, you to understand. So the functional programming paradigm is something that uh, Jax uh, relies upon. Uh, finally, um, we have the fact that Jax handles random numbers uh, completely differently compared to NumPy. And there is a very, very good reason for this. We, we're going to see that in a, in a moment. But the, the, the key point here is uh, you have to create this uh, basically key, which is a fancy name for, for like a state. So whereas NumPy's um, uh, pseudo random number generators uh, are stateful, uh, Jax is not stateful because it's a uh, as I said, uh, it's a, that's a consequence of functional programming paradigm again. So key is just a synonym for, for a state in, in Jax. And what you have to do when you're uh, generating random numbers, you have to pass the state uh, explicitly and not implicitly such like in NumPy. So here we created uh, 10 like random numbers. Uh, we sample them from a normal distribution. Uh, and we can see here that uh, we get 10 uh, random numbers. Uh, the thing I want you to notice here is that the type of this uh, X uh, array is of device array. So that basically, that, that, that's a trick. And that's why uh, Jax code is accelerator agnostic. 
uh, basically Jax automatically puts this this array onto the accelerator. So in this case, I'm using here my accelerator is set up to to GPU. If I were to set it to TPU, the code would be set directly to the TPU unit, and that's very cool. Uh, we're gonna see a consequence of that a bit later. Basically, you don't have to do the laborious to device from PyTorch syntax, etc. So this story naturally leads me to fact number four, and that's that Jax is accelerator agnostic. Uh, same code runs everywhere. You do not, not have to uh, write particular syntax for particular accelerators. That's very cool. Um, especially in the future where we, we see more and more companies being uh, like building custom AI accelerators and chips, not just TPUs and GPUs, but like companies such as Graphcore, uh, Cerebras, etc. Let's see it in practice. So here we define a JAX uh, array. Uh, again, we, we see this syntax where we have the key. We have to pass explicitly the key or the state of the, ran of the pseudo random number generator. And uh, as you can notice, there is some difference in the API design here. We have D type here. We are using for NumPy. We're using S type. So there are some minor differences, but like in general, syntaxes are very, very similar between uh, Jax's NumPy and NumPy API. Um, I mentioned that we don't have to use two device anymore. So that's in PyTorch. Uh, so this array here is directly pushed uh, to the GPU unit, whereas this one is on on the CPU. Uh, if we do some time profiling here, we can see that if let, let me run this thing. Uh, Basically, uh, this this fir first line, line number ten, uh, we we do uh, like a basically matrix multiply directly on the GPU, and that's very fast. We can see that we're gonna see results in a second. Uh, the second line here, uh, because we have a NumPy uh, dot and because we have NumPy arrays which are on CPU, uh, is going to be way slower. And NumPy only works. The, the reason why Jax exists is because NumPy only works with CPUs, and we do need to leverage existing accelerators. Uh, the third line here uh, does something like a like a modified uh, version of the two of the first two lines. Basically, we're using uh, Jax's dot product, and we are using uh, NumPy arrays, which will cause this line to push the devices to the GPU and and then do the the dot product. And because of that overhead, we're gonna have a slower result, hopefully, for this third line. Uh, and let's see the numbers here. So we have 27 milliseconds for the first line. We have 437 milliseconds for the second line because, as I said, NumPy is very slow. It's running on CPU. Finally, we have uh, 97 second, milliseconds for, for this line here because we have the overhead of sending the data from the CPU, from the host, to the GPU unit. Um, and the final number 26 is the same as this one, and that's this one here. So we basically, what we do, we, we can explicitly Using this device put, uh, put function, we can push the the the, the RA to the GPU, and then uh, now we have equivalent lines between this one and the line number ten, uh, and that's it. That's why we have the same results here. Um, a couple of notes here. Uh, first, I'm using GPU uh, as a synonym for AI accelerator. In reality, as I said, uh, Jax is uh, accelerator agnostic, which means um, basically depending on what I set here in the runtime uh, like setting here. Uh, we, we are going to run this either on TPU or GPU or whatever they have supported. Uh, second note is this block until ready. You can notice that every time I'm using Jax's uh, dot function, I'm using this block until ready. The reason is uh, Jax is using something called asynchronous dispatch system in the background, which means if I were to run this thing here, so let me just copy paste this. So if I were to copy paste this here, uh, if I were to run this and uh, maybe like let me assign that to a variable, and now I do some coding here, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the thing is, this line is going to immediately return, and this code here is going to start executing because this line actually just delegates the task to the accelerator, and we're not blocked, we're not waiting for this line to execute, which means the, the, the variable, t t temporary ver this temporary variable is still not uh, filled in, let's, let's put it that way. That's a fairly neat feature that makes things even more, even faster, but you need to be cognizant of it, especially when you're doing this time profiling. You want to measure the actual computation and not, not the time it, it's, it's ne that's necessary to dispatch, just delegate the task to the accelerator. Just be aware of that. Nice, those were some basics. Uh, now we're going to cover the transform functions. Uh, but before that, let me do a quick overview. So Jax is AI accelerator agnostic. 
uh, Jax handles random numbers a bit differently. We're gonna see why that is important a bit later. Basically, reproducibility in the environments where you have multiple uh, accelerators, where you're doing parallel programming, uh, is um, like possible with Jax, whereas NumPy has some problems there because it was designed mainly for CPU programs. Uh, then, as I said, uh, functional programming paradigm is something you need to get comfortable with. And finally, um, basically the syntax is very similar to NumPy's. That's a high level overview of what JAX is. And now we're going to get deeper uh, into these uh, transform functions. So as I said, JIT compiles your functions using this XLA and basically uh, doing that, it caches some functions and makes it very, very fast to execute our programs. Uh, I'm gonna just run this simple visualization function here and I'm gonna show you a simple example where how we can JIT a function and make it faster. So here I just defined this function. Uh, it's a sell you function, it's just an activation function. The details here are not that important. That's why I have this visualize uh, like function here. I'm just gonna run it. Uh, we're gonna see how it looks like. You can see here uh, like up until zero and that's like, I mean, it's defined here. When we are, when X is greater than zero, we just have X, which means we have a linear function here. And uh, like when we are, when the number X is smaller than zero, we have some combination of exponents here with some coefficients, etc. cetera. Uh, but that's not important. The important part here is we can transform cell U. So we pass the function inside of this JIT transform, transform function and we get a function back. And this function is compiled. Actually, it's not exactly compiled. We first need to trace it by calling it once, but like for the sake of argument, we just have a, like a super fast function right now here. Uh, and let's benchmark it. So let me uh, allocate a vector of million data points. So we have million random random uh, like numbers here, and we pass them through the cellular function, and we basically um, do a time profiling of both the normal version as well as the jet version. Let me let me run it again, and let's see the numbers. So uh, the, the, the thing here is this function is not overly complex. So the results we get with JIT, so we, we will not get a huge uh, performance boost here. But imagine once you start training neural networks, that's where uh, JIT starts shining because then the, the optimizer, the compiler has a, a bigger freedom to do various, various uh, uh, like optimization tricks such as fusing the operators, such as uh, avoiding allocating certain temporary structures, etc., and things get really, really fast, like orders of magnitude fast, faster. Here we can see that uh, basically we have uh, 1.96 milliseconds using the normal version, and then we have only 121 uh, microseconds using the digit version. So even in this simple example, we get performance benefits. So for now, um, I'm gonna leave it at here. I'm gonna stay uh, like a, on a high level here. Uh, we don't have to understand currently how JIT works, but like you, you just need to know when you see JIT, uh, JIT makes functions run fast. Let me try to beat this guy. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> let's let's uh, go ahead here. Um, second transform function, very important, is GRAD. Uh, basically, it does the uh, like the magic of automatic differentiation for you. So the same thing as dot backward in in PyTorch if you're coming from the PyTorch world, um, and uh, like a short uh, like a note here, sim uh, differentiation can be manual. So basically you have a function, you manually calculate on the paper uh, how the uh, like how the derivatives look like and then you can code those that knowledge into a function and that's a manual differentiation. Symbolic one is very similar. It's just an automatic way to, to automate the manual differentiation whereby the program is using those rules such as product rule, etc., to build up uh, like derivatives of a function. And numeric function are things like finite derivatives where you use basically numeric uh, methods to compute the derivatives. And finally, the automatic one is the one we all love. Uh, which is used in every single deep learning framework we know of. Uh, okay, let's let's see how grad works. So let's define a simple uh, function here. So it's just a sum of, as you can see here, logistic functions. So this here inside of this is a logistic function or sigmoid. And um, I just input, I just create a, like array of uh, three values here, zero, one, two. And uh, I rename the function to loss because uh, this could be used as a, as a loss function, just giving some semantics. And finally, uh, we can do grad by just uh, wrapping loss into grad. Again, we are passing function into a function, which is something you see often in the functional uh, in the functional programming paradigm. 
uh, that gives us the grad loss, so the, the gradient of the loss function, which we can evaluate. So this is contrast this to, to, to PyTorch or TensorFlow, where you just do backward. Here, you actually get the function back, and you can evaluate it at particular points. Uh, and uh, by default, I, I said here, the, the, the grad will take the derivative of the first parameter, but here we only have one parameter, so that does matter. And let me kind of run this and see what we got. So we have some numbers which mean nothing to us because the function is fairly complicated. If I were to uh, change this to this uh, sum of squares function, so if I do something like this, uh, we basically can get interpretable results. So let's do a manual derivative of this function. We're going to get, uh, so that's uh, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Remember, we are passing three numbers here. So if we do derivative of that, that's going to be uh, x1 times 2 plus x2 times 2 plus x3 times times 2. And if I were to run this, we're going to get 0, 2, 4, which makes sense because we have 0, 1, 2. Let me, let me print this out. So print x. So we have 0, 1, 2, and we get 0, 2, 4 because uh, of this. Grad basically does, because all of these are bundled inside of x, uh, Grad basically does a derivative of, of the function with respect to x1, uh, which is 2x1, and then the same for the other variables. Originally, remember, we have something like this. We have this thing plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. That's the original function. This here is the derivative, manual derivative. Okay, um, that's a simple example. Let's now uh, go and... Uh, make sure that this thing actually does what we expect it to do. Uh, we can do that using this uh, numeric differentiation method, the finite differences method. If I were to run this, we're going to get some results. There, there are some small errors here, which are a natural consequence of the fact that we're storing numbers uh, using a finite number of bits. Um, so how this works is very simple. Um, we, we, we take, so remember, x is the this array here, 0, 1, 2. Uh, we length of x thus will return us three. We get the uh, i is just the identity matrix, and so we are basically iterating and taking one hot vectors here. And basically, this is here is the uh, this is the formula of the actual derivative. So you you nudge the uh, input vector along a certain dimension a little bit in the positive direction, in the negative one, and then you divide that by the two epsilon because yeah, that's the intensity of the nudge, and. Uh, if you don't understand this, the, the best way to play with Colab is to just uh, insert a new code line here. We can see what this exactly does. So let me just paste this here. So we, we have this thing here. So we have, as you can see here, identity matrix. And so this for loop is going to take uh, one vector at a time and pass it into this function here. And so you can see that uh, basically we're going to evaluate f at the following, uh, so at least in the first iteration, we're going to evaluate it at zero, and then we're going to add this small epsilon here, so epsilon, and then we're going to have one, two, and we're gonna evaluate the function here. We are going to uh, subtract from that x minus epsilon, so, sorry, so that's zero minus epsilon. This thing will be constant for the first iteration, and then we divide this by two epsilon, and you can see that this is the definition of derivative itself. And we do that for uh, alongside every dimension. That means in the second loop, we'll have uh, epsilon here instead of here, uh, and so on and so forth. So minus epsilon here, and yeah, you, you, you get the point. So um, now we are certain uh, that grad works uh, as expected. Now let's see some, some fun examples. Uh, we're going to define a simple second order polynomial function here, uh, x squared plus x plus four. Uh, I'm going to run this to visualize it. It's always nice to visualize stuff. It's, uh, at least to me, uh, it makes stuff a bit more uh, like, uh, it gives them this gut feeling and it's easier to understand what's going on. Uh, we're going to uh, do higher order derivatives here just to show you how a powerful grad function actually is. So you can do uh, grad of f, and then you can do grad of, of the grad of f, and then you can do grad of, and you can do that n times whatever the, the number, like whatever the 
whatever n is. Uh, or you can just do it like this. You could do it like grad of grad of grad of f. This will also work. This is just shorter, so that's why I did it like this. If we were to manually uh, do a derivative of this polynomial, we'll get the first derivative will give us 2x plus 1. The second derivative, uh, so derivative of this one, will just leave us with 2. And finally, derivative of a constant is 0. That's why we have the third derivative equals equal 0. So if we print all of the values here, uh, we expect to see, because x is 1, we expect to see uh, 3, 2, and 0, right? So here it is, 3, 2, and 0. The first value is just uh, the value of the function at the input x, which is 1, which is, as you can see here, uh, approximately 6. Exactly 6. Okay, so... So far, so good. The cool thing about this is we are very close to the math. So you can basically, as you see formula in some paper, you can implement it much easier in JAX compared to PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, it's very powerful. We're gonna see uh, how powerful this whole auto diff package of JAX is a bit later. And um, now I'm gonna do a simple modification here. Let's assume we have uh, two inputs. So let's assume we have uh, y here. So we have plus y squared. And I'm just going to modify this lambda function. I'm going to skip the evaluation because the evaluation will fail uh, now. And uh, now I'm going to do the following. If we just do grads of the function, grad will by default do the uh, derivative with respect to the first parameter. That means we're going to get this thing here exactly. So we, we should expect exactly the same numbers except for the fact that f will be different when we evaluate it at, the, at x. So this obviously will not work until I enter some numbers. So this is going to be like, let me, let me say it's going to be 1. And then I'm going to pass, modify this here. So 1 x, y, x, y, and finally x, y here. That should work. Let's see if it works or not. Yeah, we get the numbers as expected. So we get the same results here. And we get 7 because once you evaluate it at y equals 1, this will be 6 plus 1, that's 7. Uh, so how can we do derivative with respect to y? The only thing we need to do here is arc nums equals uh, one instead. I think this is the syntax. Let me try it out. Let me just ignore this for, 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 the, for the time being. I'm just going to delete this and let me print this out. So we get the number two here, which is correct result. If we do a differentiation of this polynomial with respect to y, we expect to get two times y. Since y is equal one, we get uh, two here. So the thing that confuses me here is I'm not sure wh why we are getting device array here, whereas previously we had pure floats on the CPU. Uh, not sure about that. Let me let me check. Let me check if I can do it like this. Yep. Uh, for some reason, once I add. Uh, like a comma here, it's returning me device array, whatever. Uh, obviously, this is now df dy, but like, yeah, you, you, you get the point. Uh, now, let me show you how powerful the auto diff engine is. So aside from grad, which uh, can do derivatives with respect for the scalar output functions, uh, Jacobians, uh, so these Jack forward and Jack rev functions can find uh, Jacobians. So Jacobians basically can evaluate derivatives even for vector valued functions. That's the only difference uh, in, yeah, that's pretty much the, the only difference. So uh, here, let me let me take a, another function. Uh, basically, uh, we have a simple par paraboloid. If we Google it here, we can see how it looks like. So it's like a cup. Uh, to the surface in a 3D space. And um, basically, if we manually calculate the derivatives, so df dx will be 2x, df dy will be 2y. So we expect Jacobian to look something like this. Uh, if we continue on and, and, and figure out the second order derivatives, uh, we can get the Hessian number. So we can get the second order derivative with respect to x is 2, as you can see here. For y, it's also going to be 2. And if we do dx and then dy, because this does not depend on y anymore, we're gonna get zeros. And finally, how you form the Hessian matrix, and you don't need to worry about what Hessian is, it's basically just, it's just a collection, it's a matrix of, uh, as you can see here, various derivatives of the uh, multi-variate uh, function. You can simply define it using the jack rev and jack forward function. We additionally jit it, you can see how this nicely composes, and we can get the results. So the reason they're using both forward and uh, rev is because it's just optimization uh, like detail. 
uh, because one of these, the Rev1 works with wide matrices, whereas the Jack Forward uh, works with, with uh, tall matrices. I'm going to link a video down in the description which nicely explains uh, why this is. Uh, anyways, we get the numbers, so that's 2, 2 for the Jacobian, as we expected here. So if we plug in the numbers, um, so for the input 1, 1, we can see that this evaluates to 2, 2. And finally for the Hessian, we get 2, 0, 0, 2. So anyways, um, I just wanted to show you that this is possible, and if you want to dig into more details, their documentation is very, very nice, and yeah. Uh, let's continue with the final example for grad. Uh, I just took this edge case function, so the absolute value of x, and let's see how how, how Jax handles it. Uh, basically, this is how the function looks like. I just visualized it here, and uh, I printed the, the values at minus 1 and 1, which would be uh, 1 and 1, and you can see the, the, the results here. And finally, I printed the, I, I found the gradient of this function, and you can see it's not differentiable at this point at 0. It's that the gradient is undefined, uh, but like, if we were to evaluate the function at uh, minus 1, we get, <clears throat> so as you can see here, the derivative will be minus 1 for all the numbers here, 1 for all the numbers here. The interesting point is actually 0, because as you can see, this one returns the obvious result minus 1. So this one here is kind of interesting. If we were to delete this part and just kind of uh, add a small number to, 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 to 0, we'll get uh, 1 as the output. If we were to do the same thing just on the negative side, we're going to get minus 1. So basically what they've done is they defined for 0 is going to be the value is going to be defined is going to be 1. <clears throat> that's just a convention and that's how uh, Jax deals with it. Uh, we didn't get any exceptions. So yeah, I guess I, I guess that's good, at, at least in some settings. <clears throat> Finally, let's jump to VMAP. Um, Basically, when you see VMAP, you need to think about it. The, the, the main value prop of VMAP is the following. Write your functions as if you were dealing with a single data point. And this is going to become uh, more clear as we go through these examples. Let's say we have a matrix W, which is basically uh, weights. Of, you can treat it as a weights of a linear uh, neural network layer. We input some state. Uh, we, we set the shape to 150-100. And we now uh, create uh, this batched X. Uh, you can treat this as maybe 10 images, a batch of 10 flattened images. So it's 100. That means we had like a 10 times 10 pixel image. It's 100 when you, once you flatten it out. So now uh, let, if we apply the matrix, we do the dot product between W and X. Uh, this is basically uh, simulating uh, what the linear layer is doing in the background uh, when it's processing the input data. Now the trick here is uh, this only uh, transforms the uh, the single a single image it cannot handle the batch otherwise it it will crash because we are trying to multiply 150 100 uh, which is w and we're trying to multiply that with uh, 10 uh, 100 that's going to fail so this thing does not work for the batch so okay let me let me run it so how would we go about uh, making this work for, for a batch of images? So that's because that's what we care about. And because that's uh, way more efficient, as you, as you may know, uh, especially on GPUs and accelerators. Uh, basically, the, the most naive approach would be to iterate through the images and then call this this uh, this function that knows how to do, do to handle single data points, and then we just stack the results and uh, basically we we can see that uh, this will work. And the the thing is, it's very very slow because you 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 want to avoid doing for loops. You want to vectorize your 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 functions, and that's why this runs uh, 5.50. 54 milliseconds. Now let's see uh, a bit more, uh, a better approach of doing this. So this would be a better approach, but as you can see, uh, we had to completely rewrite uh, the function we had above. So we had to swap, as you can see here, we had to swap w with x. Now we have batch of x here and we have w here, and we additionally had to do a transpose. So now this will, the shapes will match and everything will work fine. So we have 100, 10, 100. And we try to multiply that with transpose version of W, which is 100, 150. And that gives us, as you can see, 10, 150, which is uh, what we expected, right? So everything is fine. Now, the problem with this, and it's additionally jitted, so it's going to be really fast. Now, the problem with this is, as you can see, uh, we have to write, depending on whether we handle singular cases or, or, or a batch of data, we have to write completely different functions. And that's not desirable. 
although you can see this is way faster so it's only 103 microseconds whereas this is 5.54 milliseconds now this is the result that Jax offers us uh, using something called vmap you just take the uh, function that handles a single data point you wrap it into this, you transform it using this VMAP and you can now pass the batch of your data without any other modifications. So that's that's very cool. Um, if I run this, let's see how, how, how fast this thing is. So it's around 100 microseconds. I think the last time I, I ran this, this was actually faster than this one, but yeah, I guess there are some, some, some variants inside of there. Okay, so I went ahead and re-ran this thing again, and now we can see that we have 118 microseconds for this function, whereas we have 143 microseconds for this one. So obviously there is some variance in here, but the point is here you have a much simpler way to write these uh, batched uh, functions and it's as as efficient as by uh, like doing this laborious work. So uh, basically, what what VMAP does uh, in the background is it takes the the for loops and packs them into this Alex uh, API mid level uh, layer of the of the API. Uh, and yeah, so now let me let me go ahead and um, modify this example a little bit. So we are going to instead of passing just X, let, let's try and pass both the W as well as the X because that's more, uh, I guess, in, in line with the functional uh, programming paradigm. So let me rerun this cell. And now let's modify this one to, to accept uh, like both the W as well as the, uh, as the batch of data. So uh, we'll need to add this thing here again. So if I were to run this uh, right now, uh, it will crash, and we'll see why. So it basically says uh, it basically says that uh, W. We're trying to 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 tell to VMAP that W has a batch dimension, where, whereas it does not have. It's, it's just a it's just a matrix uh, that, that's supposed to represent the linear layer. So what we need to do is add the in axis argument here. So in axis like this and then we say none because w does not have a batch dimension and we need to specify the batch dimension of the second input and that's zero so now this should work let me let me try and rerun it again so fingers crossed um and yeah, it did work. So basically, that's it. Now you saw in a bit more detail how VMAP works. And this is the first part of this video. So we basically saw the basics of JAX. We saw how to use the, the main transform functions such as JIT, such as GRAD, and finally VMAP. And now let's dig uh, even deeper and understand the intricacies of how, how JIT works because that will help you em enormously uh, debugging these uh, JAX programs. So let's let's continue here. So. Uh, we basically have, as I said, Jax has this onion-like uh, API layer, uh, API structure, and that's that's I guess uh, pretty much uh, always the case. But still, uh, anyways, we have NumPy as the as the highest level. Then we have Lex as the mid level, and finally the XLA. Uh, so Lex API is stricter and more powerful, and it's a simple Python wrapper around XLA. So let's see what it means when I say stricter. So if we were to add uh, in the NumPy uh, level of the API. Uh, this thing can be tolerated. So one plus one, uh, like one as the integer plus uh, one as the float uh, will work. But once we get to the mid level, uh, here we need to be explicit about the types. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll have we'll, we'll get an error. So if I run this, we'll see that uh, this is printed. So one plus one is okay. But here, add requires arguments to have the same D types. Got int thirty two and float thirty two. The reason they've done this done it this way is to be uh, more error error robust. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, the fact that the Lex layer is obviously more powerful, although as a trade-off, it's it's less uh, user-friendly, which is kind of obvious. As an example here, we have X and Y. We have uh, basically, uh, we want to do a convolution, a 1D convolution between the signals X and Y. And in NumPy, uh, API, this would uh, be uh, done like this. We just call the convol function and we get the result. On the other hand, once you get into the Lex land, uh, you have to use this conv general dilated, which is way more powerful. As you can see, it has more, much more options. You can specify the window tries, the padding, but you have to be, again, much more strict here in order to get this to work. You have to be explicit about the, the types, etc. And if I run this, uh, we can see the results here as well as here will be the same. Uh, like this, this assert should make sure that, that uh, we get the same results. And as you can see, it works uh, perfectly. Now, uh, 
final remark here is you can see here that uh, this result re re uh, returns a batched result, so that's why we have to, to index 00, 0 to get the actual result. Uh, as I said, uh, Lex API is just a thin wrapper around thin. I mean, it's a wrapper around uh, XLA, so you can actually find the DXLA function that's going to be uh, eventually called here, and that's this uh, conv with general padding. Uh, it's in C++, you can see the arguments, etc. So if you ever need to, to, to dig a bit deeper and optimize something uh, really, really, really hard, uh, then you, you, TensorFlow uh, documentation here got, got you covered. So let's get back here and, and continue. Uh, that was the uh, short uh, mention of the API. Now let's finally understand how JIT works. So uh, again, uh, I won't get into more, more details here. The whole point of this is to show that uh, JIT functions are, are faster compared to uh, non-JIT versions of the function. Here we just normalize the matrix X uh, uh, like uh, column wise. And so both the mean, we subtract the mean as well as we divide with the standard deviation of the columns and we get normalized columns. And finally, uh, the difference here is again, not, not that big because this is a super simple function. The more complex the function is, the, the bigger the differences here will be between the JIT version and between the normal version. So here we have the JIT version uh, and again, we're using a block until ready because of the asynchronous dispatch and we see the results. Okay, so let's see uh, in order to understand JIT, it, it may be useful to understand when it fails, which functions cannot, so which class of functions we cannot uh, JIT uh, will tell you, uh, will help you understand how JIT actually works uh, behind the curtains. So if I were to run this thing, uh, it's going to crash. So we are creating a simple vector of 10 random elements, and we, fo we, we pass that vector into this uh, uh, get negatives, and we call it. So now because we don't have any JIT, uh, we're gonna get a, a result back and everything works as expected. But if I were to call uh, the JIT version of the function by, by wrapping this into this JIT transform, if we run this, we are going to get a uh, like error. And it said it says here, array boolean indices must be concrete, got shaped array, blah, blah, blah. So basically what happens here is that depending on the content of X, so depending on the values of X, uh, we are going to get uh, an output that's going to vary in its shape. And that's something that's not tolerable, tolerable inside the JIT world. Let's slowly understand why this is the case. So let's start with this function. We have a simple function f, which just does uh, like a dot product between x and y and returns the result. And in the meanwhile, it also prints some, some intermediate variables here. So I, I prepare the variable x and y, just random vectors and matrix, matrix here, and uh, we, we call the, the function here, and then we again call, we have a second call here, and let's see what happens uh, after, after the second call. So I'm gonna run this. There's a couple of things happening here. First things first is the first time you run a JIT function, so that, that's line 14. Uh, what JIT does in the background is something called tracing. So it basically takes, uh, instead of uh, inputting the actual values of X and Y, it creates this abstract uh, like uh, tracer value, let's call it that way. So it's basically a, like a placeholder variable that has a specified shape and specified data type. So you can see here, uh, basically once we print X, it outputs here, instead of the value of X, it outputs traced, shaped array. It's basically float32 because we had random numbers uh, sampled from Gaussian. Uh, we have the shape here, three comma uh, four, and we have four for Y. So basically you can see these are actually passed into the function the first uh, the first time JIT is called. And uh, using that, uh, JIT can understand how the shapes are morphing uh, going through the function and finally what the output shape of the function is. And you can see here the output is also float32 and uh, the shape is three. We finally get the results here. The second time you call the function, something something funny happens and that has to do with the functional uh, programming paradigm. Basically because print functions are a side effect because we are returning the result from this function uh, by other means uh, than through the actual output here. So we are printing and that's a side effect. And because of that, uh, JIT is just going to ignore all of those side effects. And the second time you call it, because it's gonna call the compile function, uh, we won't see any printing. 
And the whole point is this, uh, th this, this caching mechanism I just explained. So that's why JIT functions are so fast. So I, I mentioned here, anytime we get the same shapes and types, we just call the compiled function. So that means if I were to now call uh, whatever, so, so basically for the whole class of inputs that have this shape, uh, and this data type, and no matter the value, we're always going to call the compile function. Uh, but if I were to call this function again, but this time with a different shape, so let's do it something like this. So x3 may be 3, 5, and this will be 5, and let me just map this like this, and I'm going to call the function again and print the results. So x3, y3. So what will happen here is that this time will we'll again trigger the compilation because the shape changed here, and so JIT is smart enough to, to, to retrace it. And as you can see here, we have the tracing happened here again. Um, hopefully you get a better picture of how uh, JIT now works, but we, we're going to continue and understand this in even more depth. So now uh, we have the same function as above. We just omit the print functions, which are the side effects. And this is how you should write your, your, your functions when you uh, want to use them with uh, JAX uh, transform functions such as JIT. So no side effects. Uh, if I were to print this, and we are going to have something called Jaxper here. So that's Jax expression. And that's basically the, let's call it like a flow model that JIT uh, creates in the background when it does its tracing procedure. So if I were to run this, let's see what we, what we have here. So you can see uh, the, what, what happens. So it, it creates this, this abstract grammar, and you, you basically have C, so add one to a, so that's going to be, uh, and a is basically the first argument, so that's x. So it's basically creating a placeholder for this thing here. Then it calls d uh, b plus one, so that's y plus one. This is this is going to be b, and then it calls the the general dot product, so that's this thing with c and d, as you can see here, c and d, and yeah, and it re returns back the e, which is this result here. So you, you can go into docs and understand uh, in more detail every single part of this of this syntax of this grammar. But like uh, now you understand a bit better how JIT, uh, when it does the tracing, uh, creates this type of of, uh, of a flow in the background, and this can be compiled using XLA. Okay. Let's see another example of a failure. Um, this time, what we do is we pass this argument uh, neck, and we condition upon it, and depending on 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 the value, whether it's true or false, it's, we're going to return minus x or or plus x. And uh, remember, uh, the first time we call JIT, we call a JIT function, uh, it's going to input abstract shape and, and like a data type. It, it won't have uh, information about the value. And that's why this thing is going to fail. So it says here, uh, blah, 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 um, abstract tracer value encountered where concrete value is expected. Uh, the problem arose in the, in the bool function. So that's basically what happens. And in order to avoid this, uh, what we can do is, is use these static arguments. Uh, by making an argument static, so we say here, hey, first argument, so that's neck, is going to be static. Uh, what we do by, by doing this is once the JIT does the tracing procedure, it will not use this abstract tracer object. It's going to use the actual, the actual value. So we are kind of lowering the level of abstraction here while doing the tracing, which is going to uh, kind of constrain the, the class of inputs uh, where this compile function can be, can be called from the cache. Uh, but as uh, in return, uh, yeah, in return, we get it to work, I guess. Okay, so let's, let's, let's call this thing. So this should now work. And the, the thing I want you to understand here again is that the first time we call it with true here, uh, we do the tracing. And then uh, the second time we call it with true, because nothing changed, uh, basically, again, we don't have the tracing procedure. Once we switch this to false, we again trigger the tracing. So now we can call this function for any integer 32. Uh, and we'll have two cached functions. So that's uh, like which run really fast. Let's continue analyzing the failures. Uh, the third failure is here. If I were to run this, let's see what we get. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Shapes must be 1D sequences of concrete values of integer types. Okay, so what happened here is, let me try and print some values again. Print x, let's print uh, x shape, let's print um, this whole product thing, and I think that's gonna work. So let's, let's try and print that. So as you can see here, what happened is that x is of trace type, 
and then x shape is actually like a concrete value and then this thing here is again a traced, so this traced object and we're trying to pass that traced object into reshape which expects a concrete value that's why this thing is uh, crashing again let's see what the solution is uh, we can basically uh, use numpy uh, prod instead of uh, jack's uh, product so this may be a little bit confusing uh, basically as you saw you have two tools to make these functions work with JIT one is to make certain arguments static uh, and sometimes you'll have to use NumPy functions instead of Jax functions. So don't ask me why. Uh, I'm only a couple of steps ahead of you. I, I recently started learning Jax myself. But like, let's try and run this. And this time it works because we have the mprod will return a concrete value and not the traced, the traced, uh, the traced object. And that's it. Uh, if you wish. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to share the collab. Uh, I'm going to uh, push it to my GitHub. So uh, go ahead and play with these failure cases yourself uh, to better, better understand how JIT works. But basically, just keep in mind that uh, JIT passes in the, these abstract objects that have the shape information and the data type information and no value. And that will help you save yourself a lot of from a lot of headache, I guess. Ah, OK. Um, this is something uh, I need to cover because there are some gotchas, uh, some um, idiosyncrasies uh, of, of Jax, which you need to understand to be able, so that we'll have easier time in the later videos uh, building up neural networks, etc. Once you understand a couple of these gotchas, things are going to be way easier. So let's start with gotcha number one. Uh, pure functions. So Jax is designed to work only on pure functions. We saw some a uh, glimpse of this when, while we were using uh, print functions a couple of minutes ago. And uh, here is an informal definition of a pure function. So first of all, all the input data is passed through the function parameters and all the results are output through the function results. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, a pure function will always return the same result if invoked with the same inputs. So it's in a way, it's like a huge memory, like a cache table and depending on the inputs, you just retrieve the outputs. So that's an uh, informal definition of a, of, a, of, a, of a pure function, and I think it's going to be good enough to understand the following cells. OK, so let's start with the cell number one, uh, example number one. So here we are violating number one because all results are output through the function results. Nope, that's not the case. We are returning some results uh, over the print function instead of through x, through, through this uh, return statement here. So uh, let, me, let me call this function. OK, on the first call, again, we have the tracing. So we, we call the executing function print statement. But the second call, uh, due to the fact that we are passing the same shape and same data type, that's the just a float 32 here, uh, we just use the cache function and we return 5. Finally, the third uh, call, uh, because we changed the, 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 the shape and the, the type here, so we basically have array now, uh, it's going to basically call and trigger the, the, the tracer again. And I think that that's pretty clear at this point of time, uh, considering the, the other examples I already covered. Uh, example number two. So you do not want to interfere with the global variables. And I think this is uh, probably a bad uh, design decision anyways. Even if we ignore the functional programming paradigm, this is probably not a good idea to do because, yeah, uh, unexpected things can happen with your program. So what's happening here is that, uh, as I said, we are we are we are violating uh, both one and two because um, let's see let's see why. Uh, so all the input is passed through the function parameters. Nope. This time we are passing the input through the global variable, and secondly, a pure function will always return the same results if invoked with the same inputs, uh, which is also not the case because depending on the value of g, we are going to return different values here uh, even if we keep x the same. So. Um, what will happen here, once we call the, the, the jitted version of the function the first time, it's going to cache the value of g, which is 0. Then we're going to update it, and then we're going to call it with 5, and it's going to use the cached, uh, it's going to call the cached version of the function, which, you, which uh, if you recall, uh, has g equals to 0 somewhere, somewhere in the, in the Jaxper, and that's why we're going to get the wrong result. So let's me, let me execute this cell. So on the first call, we get 4. And that's fine, okay? Because we, we passed 4, we had g equals 0, that's fine. Now g is equal to 10, and we have 5 here, so we expect 15, but we get 5 because the, the g version of 0 is uh, cached in the in the function. And finally, uh, if I call uh, with a different 
we, we change instead of float we pass the uh, like a JAX array at uh, this time we trigger the execution and we get the the, the correct result uh, again so in any case this is a wrong idea a bad idea to 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 uh, add these types of, of impurities uh, example number three so haiku flex are basically built upon this idea uh, the, the whole idea is that it's fine to have a stateful uh, like functionality inside of your pure function. So what I mean by that is the following. So we have x here, and uh, we do what we do here. We we create this state dictionary, and we basically just uh, add uh, depending on whether the uh, integer i here is odd or even. We add x to uh, even or odd keys and so we are preserving state obviously by doing this so this is stateful execution here and then we just return uh, this uh, sum here so as you can see we're not violating anything here so this is this is this is pure because we are only using x we are only assigning x to this state and we are only outputting whatever came out from this function so we're not accessing some some global variable or whatnot so th because of that all of this will be fine and if i execute this we are going to get a correct result and that's 50. Okay. Uh, finally, a fourth uh, example. Uh, iterators, since they are stateful, are a no-no. So if you try and do, so we built array here. And if we just do uh, like this, if we don't have any iterators, it's going to work. But on the other hand, if we use the iterator, uh, this is going to, to fail, even though we semantically, we would expect the same results. And you can see that's the case. We got 45 here, we got zero here, uh, even though we, we should have gotten uh, 45 as well. Um, here you can see this this uh, lex primitive. So that's uh, one of those uh, like mid-level uh, API functions. It's called for i loop. Uh, it's basically a smart version of the for loop, uh, which can be later compiled using the XLA. But the thing I want you to, to understand here is just that you cannot use iterators be because they are stateful and we are thus uh, uh, violating the uh, purity constraint uh, of, of, uh, of JAX. Okay, that was the gotcha number one. Uh, make sure to write uh, pure functions if you want to use them with uh, JAX uh, transforms uh, and in general. Uh, gotcha number two, in place updates, we saw this already. So you cannot uh, modify the the arrays in place. You have to, to use that uh, add set uh, syntax. So let's see a simple example here. Uh, we have to, once we create the JAX array, we have to use this add set syntax in order to get the, the, the output array. Let me run this. And you can see here the results are as expected. So this is your NumPy syntax. So row number one, where we have zero indexing and then all columns, we set them to one and that's what we see here. So I, I think I mentioned this. So if this seems wasteful, uh, basically uh, don't worry because uh, XLA is smart enough to figure out that once you're, if you're not using this input array, uh, then it will not allocate a sp uh, like a special uh, memory object for this output array. It's just going to reuse the input array and modify it in place, even though it does not appear to, to do so on this high higher level perspective, right? Don't worry about the expressiveness. We can still do everything we, c we can with, with NumPy. So here, if I uh, create uh, like a simple uh, uh, matrix of ones, uh, we can do whatever we want. We can add we don't just have to uh, assign values to, to certain locations. We can also do arbitrary operations such as addition. And you can see here, uh, we can add to every second uh, row. So every second row. And uh, starting from the third column, we add seven to one. So that's why we have these eights here, as you can see. So that's cool. Uh, that was the second gotcha. Let's 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 continue on. Uh, the third one is out of bounds uh, indexing. So this is a direct consequence of the fact that Jax wants to make this code uh, accelerator agnostic, uh, because it's very hard to communicate certain uh, certain information from the accelerators. They had to create certain types of uh, non-error behaviors, which may come as a surprise if you're not uh, already acquainted with this. So. Uh, when it comes to NumPy, uh, if we uh, allocate an array with 10 elements, so from 0 to 9, and we try to index into 11th uh, position, this will throw an exception because there is no 11th position. There is position 0 through 9. So let me try and run this, and we're going to get exception caught, blah, blah, blah. Uh, basically, the uh, this is out of bounds for x is 0 with size 10. Okay, let's see what Jack's behavior here is. If we were to try uh, to assign at position 11, so that's the same example as here, 
if we try to add 23, it's just going to ignore ignore this, this operation. So that may be uh, surprising because it will not throw any error. So let's see what the result will actually be. So we have no change whatsoever here. Finally, um, if we try to return to retrieve the element at the 11th position, which does not exist, uh, it's going to clamp 11 to the last uh, like index, which is 9, and so we are going to retrieve 9, which is super confusing as well. And this may be a cause of many, many really bad bugs. So be aware of this behavior. Uh, as I said, the reason uh, this exists is because uh, basically uh, Jax tries to uh, abstract the accelerator uh, like uh, information uh, from you. But as a consequence, you get this. Uh, and I guess if you're familiar with NAND behavior, this is kind of similar because NANDs are also in a sense not acceptable, although we, we just, we don't have the, this, we, we, we also have non-error behavior, whereas we just get NANDs back instead of uh, like the system throwing some exception. So I mentioned that here, similar to how invalid, invalid uh, similar to how invalid floating point arithmetic results in NANDs and not an exception. So keep this in mind. Uh, gotcha number four, non-array inputs. Again, this is added by design. It's not a bug. Um, in NumPy, if we try to do a sum and we pass a Python list, one, two, three here, we are going to get an expected result. So that's gonna be six, I guess. Um, in JAX, on the other hand, if we try to do this, we're going to get an exception. So sum requires uh, NumPy array or scalar arguments got list at position zero. So why is that? Uh, Let's imagine we try and make this uh, more permissive. So if we pass a Python list, we're going to convert it here to a JEX array, and now JEX sum will work on the JEX array. So this thing will work. So now let's create a list. X is a simple list. <clears throat> now let's try to using ma uh, make JEXpert to understand what will happen if we called JIT on this function. So let's try and run this. And you'll see that uh, we'll basically have this whole thing unrolled which is super inefficient. So um, the thing that happens is that we'll be passing element by element from this list and Jax will not be able to optimize this and create some smart, uh, to use some smart primitives for looping. And instead we're gonna get this inefficient optimization. So yeah, uh, keep this in mind. Now this is a, a really good place where, upon which I can base my conclusion that Jax is really nice for researchers. But if you're a beginner, uh, I don't think this will be, I don't think that optimization details should be more important than the ease of use, such as the fact that you will not have an exception if you pass in a Python list instead of a, like a NumPy or, or JAX array. So definitely things like this make me, uh, if I were to recommend to a beginner, uh, I would definitely still recommend PyTorch to be honest uh, over, over JAX. Uh, but like if you're a researcher and you want to have a lot of flexibility and you want to have like a super optimized uh, programs, I think JAX is a really good uh, bet for those guys. Anyways, let's continue. Uh, gotcha number five, random numbers. I mentioned this already. Um, now let's see it in a bit more detail. So basically what we can see here is that uh, NumPy has a stateful uh, pseudo random number generator. That means that if I execute these two functions in a row, we'll have, so this one will uh, advance the state of the uh, PRNG, and this one after execution will also advance it, and it's hidden from us. In order to understand this a bit better, let's let's kind of dissect the, the, the this generator. So we set the seed uh, to some value, seed is I think set to zero here, and basically we can fetch, there is this function get state. we can fetch the actual state of the NumPy uh, PRNG, and uh, I'm gonna print certain um, metadata from that state. Uh, then I'm going to execute call, like a sample, uh, a single number, and then we're gonna fetch the state again, and we're gonna sample the number again here, and we're gonna fetch the state again and print it. So let's see what happens uh, here. So first thing you can notice here is that the numbers here are different because the state is is internally uh, advanced. So what you can notice here is that first of all, uh, NumPy is using this uh, thing called Mersenne Twister. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, PRNG, and it's known to have a number of problems. Uh, there is a link in their documentation for why that is. It's not that important for us. You know, what you, it's probably useful to know is that it basically has the state is uh, consists of uh, 624. Uh, like unsigned integers, and every time you call, uh, you sample from that generator, uh, the we are basically uh, consuming the the entropy of the generator. Bottom line, what I want you to take out from this is that uh, 
NumPy's PRNG uh, has some problems and it's stateful, which is problematic because remember, we need to have pure functions. We are in the functional programming uh, like a world. On the other hand, this is how JAX operates. So basically you have the PRNG from JAX, you seed it with a certain value and it gives back the key and key is just a synonym for state. So basically we're now manipulating the state of the PRNG externally as opposed to internally. So uh, key is simply a, like a tuple of two unsigned integers, 32-bit uh, integers. So that's the, the state. Now what's the trick here? So now if we were to uh, sample uh, using that same state, we're going to get obviously uh, the same results. So that's co different compared to the NumPy behavior. Uh, and the reason is again, because we are not modifying the state, we're not advancing the state. Uh, and that's why we always get the same result. So again, important to, to notice here, state is preserved, state has not changed. And secondly, the results are the same. So what do we do? How do we, uh, like we obviously, this is not a random number, this is a constant function. So how do we get a randomness in, in, in JAX? So here is a trick. Every time you want to create a new random value, you basically just call the split function and it's going to return a key and subkey. Uh, subkey is used to generate a novel number and key can su subsequently be used again in the split function to get a novel key and novel subkeys. So every time you want to generate a new number, you have to call this splitting. So this may seem uh, like very rough and problematic, uh, but believe me, it helps uh, solve various uh, issues that are caused by randomness in, in, in libraries such as NumPy, etc. When you try to use them out, outside of the context for which they were designed for, and that's like basically, I guess, CPU, um, single threaded programs, etc. Okay, so let's run this cell now and see the results. <laughs> So we have the old key, uh, old key got converted into the new key. So that's the new state. Uh, and we have this sub key, uh, which we use to generate the uh, random number. So a couple of notes here. Uh, first things first is that uh, basically you can split into more sub keys than just the two of these. And secondly, uh, there is no semantic difference between uh, these, like the key and the sub key. These are basically recommendations for how to organize these uh, states. And basically you, you use key to generate novels to split and generate novel key and another sub key. And you use the sub key to generate the current random number that you currently need to consume. And that's pretty much it. So uh, after having uh, explained all these uh, complex details about how to handle PRNGs compared to NumPy, is there any good reason for it? Uh, for it? And the answer is yes. So why this design? And the answer is, uh, can the code with the current design, with NumPy's design, be uh, reproducible, parallelizable, and vectorizable? In the case of NumPy, number one is uh, obeyed. Uh, in the case where you have a single-threaded uh, program on the CPU, uh, basically, there there is no problem. So let, let's let's see this this concrete example. Let's see let's assume we have a function called bar uh, that generates a random number and a, a function called bez uh, that also generates a, like a random number. Finally, we have a function fo and I don't know if I'm pronouncing these right. So this function returns uh, bar plus two times uh, bez uh, and. Uh, don't know if you can see the problem with this with this code. Once we start and try to call uh, this foo, foo function on, on line 14. Now, the, the problem is um, NumPy assumes uh, a single threaded environment and uh, basically Python uh, guarantees that this will be executed to the best of my knowledge from left to right, which means every time we run this, uh, we are going to get the same result back, which means uh, number one is obeyed. So that means we have reproducible programs. So now what happens if we jet this function or if we, um, and the JIT uh, decides to uh, basically parallelize the, this, this program and calls bar on one accelerator, on one core and BAS on another one. So what can happen is that the order of execution can change. And if that happens, we may get different results. So if the first function to be called returns uh, 0.3 and the second one returns 0.4, uh, depending the, of the order, we'll either have 0 0.3 plus 2 times 0 0.4, or we'll have, or we'll have uh, basically 0 0.4 plus 2 times 0 0.3, and that basically leads to different outcomes. Which means this will not be a reproducible result in the case of parallel, uh, like uh, 
computing on parallel like uh, cores, machines, whatever. Similarly, for the vectorization uh, part, basically uh, NumPy guarantees that if you generate uh, like numbers, if you do this, like if you iterate uh, in a for loop and you generate uh, sequentially random numbers, uh, that will give you the same results as if you were to just set size to three. On the other hand, Jax does it differently. Uh, if you generate individually, uh, that will give you different results compared to if you generate from, from uh, all the numbers at once using a specific key. So, and here again, you can see the, the, an example where we, we generate three sub keys uh, using the split function and not only two keys, as I previously uh, mentioned that. Um, so let's run this function and you can see that basically uh, NumPy uh, has the same results, whereas uh, like uh, Jax does not have the same results. So if you're using the common SIMD pattern, so that's the, I guess, single instruction multiple data, which is common in machine learning, uh, whereas you want to apply the same functionality across different batches, uh, you sometimes want to have the same rand randomness being applied across the, 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 all of the batches, and uh, NumPy does not allow to do that. Uh, that's how I understood this, this, this part about the violating the vectorization uh, problem. Let me know if I if I got this wrong. Uh, okay, that's that's pretty much it. That was the the random numbers. Uh, we have just two more uh, gotchas to go, and that's it. Uh, so gotcha number four is the control flow. Uh, it's fairly we, we we've seen something similar to this. Uh, so basically, control flow plus grad, nothing is there is no problem. Basically, this transform function, so the grad transform function, can deal with these types of of conditioning on the value of a function. I went ahead and ran this, and you can see the results. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, just analyze this function. You'll, you'll, you'll see that at three, there is a, this, this jump where we have a piecewise defined function here. But the whole point is if we were to take a grad of this function and evaluate it at two and at four, so that's just before this discontinuity and just uh, after it, uh, we'll get valid, valid uh, gra gradients. Let me run this again, uh, just to update the state of the cell. And if we were to JIT this function um, and Basically, it will fail because we are conditioning on X. So we have to. The solution is to 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 make it a static argument, and then it's going to work. So if I run this, it's going to work. And we already saw how to handle uh, this case of conditioning on a value. So let's see some more interesting uh, cases. So here we are conditioning again on the value, but this time the value decides the length, the the number of loops we'll have in this in this function. And uh, the way to go around this is again, uh, make this uh, a static, static argument, which will make uh, JIT uh, trace this, this uh, function uh, using the, for, for X, using the abstract tracer, so the shape and data type, whereas for N is gonna use a concrete value. So let me run this cell and see what we get. Okay, so uh, as you can see, we have some huge, huge Jexper here. And the reason being is because we have, uh, as you can see here, uh, 15 was uh, passed for n, and this is the best way that uh, JIT can can deal with these types of, of primitive of native Python uh, <coughs> for loops. Again, importantly, uh, you should not change static uh, values too too often. Otherwise, we'll be triggering recompilation all of the time, and then the overhead will maybe be uh, detrimental to the speed of your application. Let's see how this can be avoided uh, and make a bit more optimal. So a better way to do this is to use the low level API again, so the Lex API. And there is this, uh, as we saw, for i loop function. And we can rewrite the above uh, problem. And I went ahead and just rewrote it uh, here. And you can see that, um, so this is the same function as the above one, just using the uh, Lex uh, API. And if we now do the make, uh, if I call the make uh, Jexper, and let me, let me kind of run this, we'll see that this code is way more succinct, it's more concise compared to the above one and thus more efficient, I guess. I haven't profiled this example, but yeah, I can assume it's more efficient. Uh, you can go ahead and analyze this, these two cells uh, at your own pace, but the, the whole point was to be aware, uh, just be aware that uh, using these uh, lower level API functions, you can sometimes uh, make get more out of JIT. Uh, finally, uh, the only reason I have this one is to understand that uh, you can condition sometimes <clears throat> on the uh, dimensionality of your data, and that's allowed. Because imagine, uh, this means that for the whole class of X, uh, where you have, where X is two-dimensional, uh, this uh, can, like a function can be cached and will work and we can fetch it and use it. <clears throat> so let's run this one and let's see the results. 
So I passed on, uh, like a imp it is an input array which is not two dimensional, and because of that we took this branch, which means whatever we get as an input we just uh, return as the output, and that's why we have this super simple uh, like a Jasper for this particular function being traced with this input. Hopefully all of these uh, help you crystallize and understand JIT because I guess I, I think that's arguably the the hardest part to understand about Jax how JIT works in the background. Um, that's it. Final, final, uh, final gotcha is uh, like uh, how to handle NANs in JAX. The usual uh, non-error behavior is to simply return a NAN in the case of uh, like uh, operations such as this one, div division by zero. So if I were to comment out this thing here, and let me run this cell, so we'll, we won't have any error. We'll just hit, have a NAN. So if we want to actually debug uh, and understand where the NANs uh, came from, you want to like the program to throw some exceptions. You can uh, do, for example, this. You can find more in the docs. But basically, there is a there is a way to do it. And now it will be throwing exceptions, I guess. Let me try again. Yeah, now it's throwing an exception. So yeah, that's keep that in mind. Final cell. Um, Jax enforces single precision. Uh, why? Because uh, actually nowadays it's fairly common to train your models, especially the big models like big transformers in FP16 or mixed precision or even FP8, so means uh, 8 bits only. And because NumPy is aggressive in promoting uh, like uh, certain variables into double, so that means 64 bits, uh, Jax made it by design that they are enforcing 32 bits. So that may lead to some, again, some, some uh, peculiar behavior such as this one. Uh, you say I want to like a, a vector with thousand uh, random numbers uh, which are 64 uh, like bit uh, long and if we were to print the data type of the actual array we'll have flow 32 which is not intuitive right so be aware of this and there is a way around it you can set certain flags if you don't want to have this as a default behavior as a quick summary we saw the basics of JAX such as uh, the, the 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 fact that it's using is, is based on functional programming paradigm uh, we saw like various transform functions such as uh, JIT, uh, GRAD, VMAP. Uh, then we saw we, we went deeper into into JAX. We saw the uh, layered uh, like onion sh like layered uh, API. We saw uh, many details of how JIT works, and we saw many gotchas that JAX uh, has, which may catch you uh, by surprise. So you should be uh, aware and cognizant of these. Uh, finally, uh, some conclusion of mine to. Uh, who should be using Jax and who should be using other frameworks. As I said, I think Jax is very good if you're a researcher, you want to be very flexible and, and you want to have a powerful tool and you also want to, once you train big models such as uh, in whatever industry AI lab you're working, you're going to be training big models. So uh, having a uh, like very uh, optimized code is super important. But if you're a beginner on the other hand, I think it may be uh, a bit too harsh for you uh, currently with the current state of Jax and I don't think that's going to change. So um, basically all of these optimization details, such as the fact you cannot use Python lists, they will just throw exception because uh, it can hurt the performance. Uh, because of all of that and because of the uh, functional uh, uh, paradigm, uh, it's, I think it's, hard, it's uh, easier to just start with PyTorch. Especially when we get to neural networks, uh, it's a more natural approach to approach neural networks with object-oriented uh, from the ob object oriented perspective, at least in my opinion, maybe uh, I lack experience with Jack, so I, 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 yeah, but that seems to be the case. Anyways, in the next uh, video, we're going to cover some concepts such as uh, pie trees, handling states, which are all uh, basic components that we'll need to later build neural networks from scratch in pure Jax and also in Haiku or, or Flex. Uh, hopefully, you found this video useful. It took a lot of time to prepare the notebook, to prepare uh, everything I wanted to show you here. So, if you did like it, uh, consider sharing it out also consider subscribing to this channel if you haven't already also do join the discord community there is a lot of smart people there and we have a community for, for like there is more than thousand hundred people at this point of time so somebody will help you out if you if you, if you have some doubt or, or, or questions uh, in any case until next time bye bye